welcome to all of you and uh, thank you for registering for this course it's architectural conservation and historic preservation uh, today i will talk about basically introduction to the course the most of the topics which are covered and uh, there may be some slight change later on as we go on during the course uh, but many topics which have been covered what is the purpose i will try to sort of give a brief overview of this course uh, this course architectural conservation and historic preservation uh, we offer uh, at iit kharagpur in architecture regional planning department uh, we offer this course both at undergraduate bachelor of architecture level and also as the postgraduate level which is master of city planning level as an elective course uh, what I am trying to do is that in this course, uh, which is spans over a period of uh, uh, 2 months uh, and uh, 20 credit course, uh, I am sort of cover both the architectural part and the historical preservation or the urban design or uh, city part. Um, and it is not only meant for architects. Uh, anybody who is interested in the historic preservation part uh, can uh, take part and to try to share, uh, I will try to share what we mean by conservation, historic preservation, what are the basic objectives and uh, uh, my uh, email id is there and uh, you can see and uh, there is also my uh, website. Uh, where some basic informations are there about me and my other topics of interest. Teaching assistant, uh, they will be assisting me uh, in uh, during the course uh, in answering the basic queries and um, uh, any clarification you may have during the course. Now, let us talk about the heritage conservation, the need debate and the purpose of the heritage conservation. Uh, why should we conserve? what should we conserve and how should we conserve. There is often a debate going on between the conservationists who are basically the archaeologists and also the planners. Uh, they deal with the old historical structures, but many of the practicing architects or the people say that what is there to need of conserve the old historical monuments. We cannot conserve everything because until and unless we make space for the new buildings. Uh, there is so much a problem. So, this debate of what should be conserved, why should we conserve, they are all related with each other because until and unless we talk about why should we conserve, we also cannot say what should we conserve. Is this the date 100 years old or uh, 500 years old or 50 years old? Uh, that is a debate. So, it all are interrelated and until and unless we try to understand this ourselves, we really do not know what should we do about these structures. Because this is for sure that whatever old uh, is not gold, we cannot conserve everything whatever. And also there are various approaches of the conservation. So, related with that, this is a very, very important part is that the significance of the heritage. What what is the significance of heritage in our daily life? Why should we uh, conserve it? Uh, what means that not only uh, we as a professional, but also to the common people, they are very important part of the conservation. And so, understanding the significance or we will see what is the value of conservation or evaluation of the conservation is very important. And this evaluation is not only always in economic terms, so that is very important, it is important. But I am saying it is not the only factor. There are many, many other aspects which need to be set out, which need to be discussed, which need to be debated to understand that why should we conserve a particular structure or place and what is the significance. And when we talk about this significance, the many, many terminologies come into our mind. Sometimes we call it restoration sometimes we call it preservation, sometimes we call it adaptive reuse, sometimes we call it reconstruction. So, there are so many, many terminologies which are related to the conservation often it uh, sort of confuse people that. So, these terminologies 
what it means and what it signifies and what should be done in a case a particular case are also very interrelated with the purpose, significance and the value of a cultural property. When we are talking about a cultural property, one cultural property or a group of cultural property, we are probably talking about architectural conservation. But we also must understand that there may be areas, there may be city, there may be a region which have some significance heritage wise. So, the scale may vary. So, there is some sort of a distinction between architectural conservation or and urban conservation, but there is a continuity, it is a continuum. Uh, it is a matter of a scale, but they are all interrelated. Uh, it is a difference between the focus that when we are talking about architectural conservation, probably we can talk about a particular structure. When you are talking about urban conservation, we are probably talking about a larger area a part of the city or different parts of the city or sometimes a city or sometimes a group of cities or not only the cities, the settlements also or probably there are areas which are no longer a settlement, maybe archaeological sites, uh, we may talk about that. So, there is a continuum and we must understand that uh, what are the focus and what is the difference between urban and architectural conservation, what is the linkage, one cannot be dealt with uh, without considering the other. Uh, then I have mentioned about the heritage economics, so I will talk about that is I will not talk about the detail of the economics part, but we must understand these economics does not mean the in monetary terms, it is that what is more sort of a, uh, a sort of a return yes, but not always in monetary term. Uh, some sort of a valuation in the present context has to be also taken into consideration because just saying I am emotional, I want to preserve it does not lead us anywhere because there are so many other aspects. So, I will touch on that aspect also the evaluation method and particularly in relation to a heritage site or a cultural property without going into much detail. So, that is about the need debate and the purpose of the conservation that will be a very basic introductory course with some of the examples uh, from various places, various structures. I will like to share that with you uh, to sort of set a framework uh, to start before we go into the detailed topics. As I already mentioned that uh, when we talk about heritage conservation or preservation, there are so many terms coming restoration, preservation I have already mentioned that, but what it means is that there this is uh, different sides of the same coin that um, they are not very different, but they are talking about a different approaches and there is no hard and fast rule that uh, what approach should be there there are certain guidelines, there are certain objectives and depending on the purpose, depending on the context, uh, this what approach should be taken, what path should be taken uh, in a particular situation may vary. So, that so in this part of the topic or the lecture, uh, I, I will talk about these different terminologies which are indirect conservation, uh, preservation, consolidation, restoration, adaptive reuse, rehabilitation, how an old building uh, which is no longer in use, uh, should we demolish that or do they have any sort of a value in our present society, uh, can we use them, can we recycle them and if we do that then how much can we change, how much alteration. So, all these are part of the adaptive reuse and the rehab rehabilitation and these also has to have some guidelines and these guidelines and the methodologies uh, with examples, various examples, real life examples, we will talk about that. Uh, then also there are other terms, uh, reproduction and reconstruction, uh, there are very world famous examples, international examples of reconstruction, we will talk about that, that uh, what it means actually, what it significant. Uh, signify under what situation we take this decision to go for this approach, 
so, and in this process, we will like to see what are the basic terminologies approaches. So, rather than terminologies, I will like to mention this as I mentioning there, the divergent approaches under the broad umbrella of the term conservation. As I have already mentioned that uh, we will talk about that with various case studies, so that you will see for yourself that uh, what is the different approaches and apparently there may be a same situation, same context, but still um, these versus this approach vis-a-vis -vis the other approach may be more uh, practical or pragmatic and it has been adopted. Uh, so, that you will uh, find uh, or understand better when I discuss this examples with you. Now, uh, as I am talking about the various divergent approaches, uh, what comes to your mind that uh, who decides uh, are the rules are there and uh, what sort of guide one in that, uh, there comes a basic uh, question of ethics and assessing the significance of the. For example, if I talk about Taj Mahal, you already know about Taj Mahal is a world hated site. When I talk about Taj Mahal, uh, how what should be done for Taj Mahal probably is not the same as what uh, probably will do for, uh, uh, I talked about the old building in IIT Kharagpur, probably uh, they are both valuable, but what should be the approach, uh, what should be the ethics, what should be the guidelines, they may vary and they may vary brings us to the question of these assessing the significance of a cultural property. So, there are various types like tangible heritage, intangible heritage, um, the, there can be a water body which is also very important, it is not always the structure. Uh, there can be a sort of a craft which can be of a heritage value which is intangible heritage and there can be a structure itself which is a tangible heritage, but which may be sort of important not because it is beautiful simply, but because it represents or is associated with something. So, these uh, significance or value and what are the ethics or the guidelines uh, which sort of govern one to take this decision or to decide a particular approach uh, is very important. So, we will talk about this ethics in conservation and uh, what guides one to adopt a particular approach. Uh, while we are talking about this basic format, uh, it is important to know that uh, how these conservation movement are actually uh, came about. Uh, is it different from country to country or is there any universal law? Uh, officially or formally the conservation movement uh, came in Europe, uh, this is the birthplace and which you call the conservation movement and also it is not a very static one, it also changes over the years that uh, what was done or what is accepted uh, 50 years back and what was permissible 50 years back is not the same. So, it is a very dynamic approach that even while uh, the different situations are coming. Uh, we are learning from the situation more and more about that what uh, sh one should do, it is learning the lesson and accordingly uh, the international bodies and others they are changing. So, it is very important to see this change of the approach, uh, why it happened. So, this uh, brings us to the history of conservation movement. Uh, we will talk about the foundations of the movement, uh, that what was happening in the pre-modern age, how the buildings were taken care of in a society, uh, what was the ethics or guidelines which were there, or whether there was an ethics there. Uh, then we will talk about the first modern uh, movement, the how it started, the first modern ideologies of conservation. There were various ideologies and which actually um, came after the post-industrial society that when there is a lot of demolition, especially in uh, Europe and United States, uh, then actually there was a formally a conservation movement or that is the genesis of the 
modern conservation movements. We will talk about that and we will also talk about the crisis of the movement. The crisis actually happened during the second world war time where there was a mass uh, destruction all over the world where many many heritage the ancient structures, uh, places uh, all of them were demolished. So, uh, we will see very interesting case study that uh, after this how the various countries adopted the various policy and why the uh, took a various policy. Uh, it is related to their culture, it is related to their intention, it is related to certain philosophy. So, we will talk about this situation and we will see that how these laid uh, or how it helped to sort of make uh, the formal conservation movement. Um, then we will talk about the parallel narratives what is happening because as I told you that different countries adopted different scenarios or different approaches after the world war and we will talk about the parallel narratives especially in the context of West. Uh, so, the internationalization of the heritage when there were charters and convention, the Venice charter is very well known for that uh, which happened in 1964, uh, where uh, this uh, sort of took an uh, international outlook and many, many countries uh, sort of came together, people uh, of the various discipline, archaeologists, engineers, architects. Um, uh, historians, they came together and they decided some sort of a policy framework uh, which should be or can be applicable to the various countries, various situations, various societies. And also UNESCO is one of the um, body, in a international body which plays a very significant role. We will talk about that later and ICROM which is based in Rome in Italy uh, which played a very important role in the training of the or the education or awareness of the uh, conservation professionals. So, a new professional body started because of that and uh, we also should talk about now at the present end in the stage of globalization due to the globalization, how the situations are changing, what are the threats at the moment. Um, because we have seen that how many, many countries, um, not many, some countries, uh, because of some sort of a misguided uh, policy, uh, the many of the important structures are being demolished consciously, intentionally. So, uh, in and at the same time, you know, the globalization, there is a mixing of cultures, there is a people uh, more moving from one country to another. Uh, so, in this globalization, how the conservation is coming up, what should be the change priority, a lot of tourism is happening all over the world, or what is the impact of that for the conservation movement, we will talk about that in the this particular module which is the history of the conservation movement. Uh, while well, talking about the UNESCO and other, we often come across a terminology which is called the World Heritage Site. Taj Mahal is a World Heritage Site, Kunarok in India is a World Heritage Site, uh, then Darjeeling Railway is a World Heritage, Himalayan is a World Heritage and recently the force of Rajasthan has become World Heritage. Um, Ahmedabad city last year was declared as a World Heritage, that is in India, but all over the world there are particular sites. Uh, structures, pressings, uh, which are declared as a world heritage sites. So, we sh must discuss that it is something one each country is very proud of uh, that to have so many world heritage sites. People, uh, tourists come from all over the world to see the world heritage sites, it is almost the value goes up. And uh, so, we will talk about that what are these world heritage sites, what make, what are the significance of the world heritage site. And also interesting to know that these when we are talking about the world heritage site, they are not always the old structures. Very recently in India, Chandigarh, uh, Lake Arbutus, a capital complex has been one of the declared as one of the world heritage sites. A very recent structure, last century it was built after uh, independence of India. So, we will talk about many of these structures which are re relatively recent time and they are also declared as a world heritage site. So, we must know that what is the selection criteria of world heritage sites, who decides that and what are the different typologies of the world heritage sites uh, and what is the process uh, with the examples of the various world, various types of world heritage sites, various 
uh, world heritage sites from various countries. We will like to take some of the examples and then also uh, related to that is another one which is the endangered sites and related issue because there are many world heritage sites which were once been declared as a world heritage site, but they become endangered. Bamiyan Buddha is one of that. Uh, and uh, many of the world heritage sites UNESCO said no uh, it is not being followed. So, it becomes a red mark and which becomes an endangered site. So, we will talk about that that what makes them endangered and how do we cope up with the situation, what are the policy and can something be done about that. Uh, so, while talking about the world heritage site we also will discuss that or what is the process of the world heritage site? As we say that who decide uh, what is the um, because every every country thinks that their heritage is most important, and uh, so what is the process? What is the that process is called the preparation of the nomination dossier. It's quite formalized now. Uh, UNESCO has very good guidelines for that. Uh, so there is a process of a tentative list and the guidelines for preparing the nomination dossier with various examples we talk about that and very recently uh, in a recent time we are talking about the serials nomination like in India there is an example of the force of Rajasthan where it is calling as a serial nomination. Even Chandigarh capital complex is a part of the serial nomination which is transcontinental uh, because it is taking care of uh, not only Indian uh, example, but Corbusier work uh, scattered or covering various countries. Uh, so, we will talk about the serial nomination, what is the purpose and what it means, what is signify and most important that the role of the state parties that uh, representing a country, uh, what is the responsibility that when one site is declared as a world heritage site, then what the state parties do, what is their role, what is their responsibility and uh, how the interaction happened with the international body. These are very important. So, this is a very interesting to learn that uh, what is a very exciting case is uh, that uh, when it is declared. Uh, so, we will talk about some of the case studies from India and other places basically emphasizing that this process or the procedure which takes years actually. Um, now, uh, when we are talking of the world heritage sites that are very important is almost the international highest level uh, world heritage site. It is also very important to understand that it is not only the declaration of the world heritage sites which is important, but how to manage the world heritage sites. Once it is declared as a world heritage site something uh, a country feels very proud about. Uh, it attracts a lot of tourists, but how do you manage, how you keep that places, do we sort of keep that under showcase and preserve at it is then it becomes a very uh, dead thing uh, which is not actually desirable. So, how do we manage this world it decides, uh, what is the process, who are the stakeholders, the people who are staying there because they are not all monuments, they are living cities, they are sometimes living structures um, taken care of by the local people. So, what is the role of the various stakeholders, state parties? Uh, the different local stakeholders, government, the public, the community. Uh, while we are talking about this process of the management of world heritage sites, uh, also very important to know that a uh, concept of buffer zone is there. So, that buffer zone is actually sort of a, a cushion to the world heritage sites. It sort of uh, gives a sort of a protection. Uh, but these are also living cities, living areas where people live most of the time there may be the natural areas. So, what is that concept of the buffer zone? How do we declare or understand or define the buffer zone? Uh, what are the implication of that buffer zone? This also uh, done in a very scientific methodological way. So, it is very important to know that under different situation how the buffer zone has been declared. Very, very interesting studies are there. I um, will discuss with that some of the studies. Um, so, as I say the managing the world heritage site is very important which involves the planning and the implementation and the monitoring. Monitoring is very important so that it does not become an endangered site. Uh, so, this is uh, all about the world heritage sites with some of the examples on case study which we will talk about that. Then we will go to another property. World heritage site is very important. I mean it is the almost the highest level of the world heritage site. Uh, 
but we will not confine our uh, studies to that, we will start with that, but we are concerned about all types of heritage, all levels of heritage. Um, it can be a simple structure, uh, not of the status of Taj Mahal, but I mean it is also maybe very important like I talked about our old building in IIT Kharagpur in my uh, introduction. So, um, we will talk about this uh, causes of the decay in the cultural property that what are the common threats. We are going to the next module then, we will talk about the common threats to the historic sector and the sites and uh, we will talk about what really uh, causes the decay because if you have to preserve something, we have to know that what causes the external causes or the decay of the structures. Uh, there may be various reasons, there may be biological or the botanical, uh, botanical causes, there may be the natural disaster, flood, earthquake, um, various types, uh, there may be the fire also and there may be the man-made causes of decay like the tourism, uh, it is a very common sight that the old monuments you see a lot of people start writing their names which is a uh, punishable offence, but it is not only uh, unethical, but one must be able to understand that why people do that and uh, what how we can prevent them. So, probably the awareness and other aspects which are there, it can be terrorism also that which can cause a decay. So, uh, to understand the decay, we have to talk about the survey of the historic building materials, which is a different aspect altogether. So, uh, this introduction, uh, which uh, I will sort of come up to this, and this is a different module. So, I will come to that in my next lecture, and we will talk about that uh, how to understand the decay, how to document the decay, and uh, how to sort of because that will decide that what we can do or what type of intervention can be done in an historical structure. Thank you. We will continue in the next module.